All right, so that's brown. How about green? We touched on that a little bit with squadron maintenance. So squadron maintainers will wear green. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. If you are just joining us, I recommend you go back to episode 11, where you can hear Aircraft Carriers Part 1 and find out that I am Vincent Aiello, your host, and that with us today is U.S. Navy Captain Eric Anduzzi, call sign Pappy, former Big XO of the Aircraft Carrier USS Carl Vinson. And we were right in the middle of a riveting discussion on the aircraft carrier itself, including flight deck jersey colors. So this is episode 12. We're going to pick up the discussion here. And after the interview, we will wrap up with the normal fighter pilot podcast ending. So here we are back to the interview with Pappy. So squadron maintainers will wear green ABEs, uh, whether it's catapult guys, elevators, downstairs, they'll wear green also, the ABEs equipment. Again, more of a maintenance, repair kind of a situation. Those are wrench turners. Okay, so these are people that might work on the catapults or the arresting gear. In fact, while flight operations are taking place, they will be down in those facilities working the arresting gear motors and various components. Absolutely. All right, so how do I tell a squadron green shirt from a ship's green shirt? Is there something on the shirt itself? Oh, so every shirt has some sort of stencil, whether it's yellow, red, blue, purple, it'll have some sort of stencil. It can be something as simple as a C, which stands for cat cruise, or it can be a VFA-143 stenciled on it. And uh, it'll say, v, for example, a, a airframer will say VFA-143A slash F which means that guy is an airframer, which is a hydraulics mechanic for the airplane that belongs to VFA-143, for example. So just at a glance, we know what someone's... Correct. What, and, what and, and not only on their jersey, right, but also on their flocos, because everybody on the flight deck wears life-saving equipment, flotation devices. So it's a vest with a... Uh, gosh, does it even have pockets? I think pockets are kind of banned, right? There is one pocket for the automatic inflation system. Okay. But, uh, but it, has, it has no pockets. It has some reflective tape, right. and it usually has some sort of stencil on it that denotes who that person uh, belongs to and where he works. And it's usually the same color as your jersey. And the idea is if you fall in the water, does it have some sort of automatic inflation system? Yeah, it or, does. Okay. It does. It so does automatically in inflate once it uh, it comes in contact with salt water. Salt water. So like the sea wars we've talked about on a previous episode, mm-hmm. if they, God forbid, sailor gets blown over by jet exhaust or something else, then if they hit the water and become unconscious because it's 60 feet up, then it should inflate. Absolutely. And, and not only is it inflated, it also flips them right side up so that they uh, don't drown. And then some reflective tape so that the helicopter or other surface vessels can pick them up. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's see. I've got two other colors here, white and red. So let's go with uh, red. How about? So red are the Ortis. So red is uh, anybody responsible for arming, disarming the airplanes or handling ordnance. Okay. So squadrons will have r- red shirts and the ship will have red shirts. The ship's red shirts will usually have a G stenciled on them. They'll belong to whether it's G1, G2, G3, G4, or G5. And then the squadron red shirts or ordies will have whatever squadron designation with AOs. And uh, those are the, the individuals responsible for arming, disarming, or handling ordnance. Aviation ordnance men. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then so we have people who deal with ordnance the way it should. And then don't we also have some red EOD folks? So that's an explosive ordnance disposal. So if we have a problem with ordnance. Can they also be out there helping out? They do. They, we do have some of those. Um, most of them just wear the, the red shirts. I think they wear a white vest on top they of their... They might wear two different colors to, to denote themselves. Denote themselves. Okay. So, you know, they wear the red jersey, and then they wear a white vest, which is, hey, I'm an ordnance handler, but I'm responsible for some safety. Okay. And we'll get to that white in a second. How about crash and salvage? Do they wear red as well? They also wear red. Okay. So our onboard firefighters with their little fire trucks, essentially, mm-hmm. I mean, they're not that little, but... They are out there all the time, ready in case something happens. And then if there is a fire or some other conflagration, Mm -hmm. then they can respond and use the different methods and the different fluids to try to put that out right away because fire is a problem at sea. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about white then. And then any other colors I miss? I think that's all of them. I think that's it. So finally, white white usually uh, becomes uh, some sort of safety observer or some troubleshooter, which technically is a safety observer. This is your last safety observer before you go flying. So let's talk about troubleshooters first. Troubleshooters belong 
to the squadrons, and they are more experienced senior maintainers that give the airplane one last look while the airplane's on the catapult before sending it flying. The other white shirts belong to the ship, and they are safety observers and part of the VLA landing uh, system folks wear white shirts as well. So you can equate white for safety. For example, the safety officer on the ship, he'll wear a white, uh, a white jersey and, and a white vest with a big green cross on it. So it's not a red cross for like medical, no, it's a green cross exactly. like, hey, I'm and, the safety guy. And those are other personnel that wear white, also medical okay. personnel. Thanks for so the reminder. Be, yeah. yeah, so they'll be out there as well. As well. Okay. How about the shooters? I mean, we haven't touched on them yet, but they wear, what color do they wear? So shooters wear yellow. Okay. They are airplane, you know, directors, movers, if you will. So those guys uh, are aviators that are doing a tour on the ship, and they are the final check on setting up the catapult or setting up the arresting gear when an airplane goes flying or comes landing. And we have aviators to to kind of give that common sense, does this sound right look before somebody goes flying. But, yeah, they are part of the yellow shirt uh, okay. crowd. And do they wear, like, a yellow-green stripe uh, float coat or something? I'm trying to think of... They seen... wear... Or maybe uh, on their the helmet. Helmet. Okay. The helmet is white and green, and you also have like the the catapult um, top side safety of server warriors white and green. So it is a combination, you know. And, and you can see how complicated it is when you know Jello and I here keep on uh, coming up with different colors. Not only do you have the jerseys, you have the float coats, you have the helmets. Everything means something. And how you wear it is important for your job. So from the air boss's perspective, it looks like a big bag of Skittles got poured out on the flight deck because you got colors running everywhere. How, how many people are on a normal day operation up on the flight deck? Any idea? I mean, uh, I... Not, not, not quite sure, but, you know, it's a couple of hundred folks uh, on topside at any given time. All right. Well, that is a hive of activity up on the flight deck, no doubt about it. Okay. So an airport, again, going back to my earlier example, if, if we're at LAX, I mean, aircraft are coming and going all day long. Is it that way for an aircraft carrier? An aircraft can take off and land whenever they want, or how does that work? Yeah, so not quite, right? <laughs> there are two different types of operations, and I mentioned them quickly earlier, uh, cyclic operations and carrier qualifications. So during carrier qualifications, the air wing is trying to get their landing proficiency back, some landing training, and what we do is we open the flight deck up for a certain period of time at which point airplanes come down and for, let's say, four hours, they are taking off and landing, taking off and landing as many times as they can to get better. So aircraft are coming down. They might even have their hook up to just do a touch and go. Whether it's touch and goes, traps, it it doesn't matter. It's all about proficiency. There are some rules on how many of each you need, how often, but for the operations piece of it, right, it's just four hours of we're going to be launching and recovering airplanes. So that whole four-hour period, though, the ship is moving into the wind, so we need to do this in pretty wide open ocean, not near sea lanes or islands or anything else. Absolutely. Anytime we are launching or recovering airplanes, we have to ensure that the winds are in a favorable condition to recover and launch those airplanes, and the carrier has to be pretty predictable. Okay. Plus, it gets confusing because some aircraft might come out from the beach and land, and some might leave the ship and go back to the beach. So people have to keep track of all that. Yeah, there's people coming, there's people going. When this is happening, the air boss's role is essential in coordinating who's coming down, who's leaving, uh, who's still in the pattern. Uh, He becomes a director of all of that up and down going on. So it's very fluid, unlike, I would argue, cyclic operations where we have an air plan which is the schedule for the day. And now we know at a certain time, the air boss can sit and look at it. In fact, he can even count aircraft. Hey, 12 just went and 10 came back, so we're good. It's not like who knows if this kid needs another couple landings because he's working on his qualification and maybe they don't just think he's doing too well or whatever. But let's talk about cyclic operations. So how, how does that work? So cyclic operations is, is basically how we operate the flight deck on any given day on deployment. One of the things that people don't realize is there is no day crew or night crew for the flight deck. It is the same crew working from the first airplane we launch or even move till the last plane stops. And those folks have about a 12 to 14 hour span on them before we 
you know, get them too tired and it becomes unsafe. So 14 hours is about the longest we can do for a flight day. And that's already pretty long because it's not like they're up there playing their iPhones. I mean, they're up there humping. Absolutely. It they're, can be, they're working hard. It, it can be the, the summertime in the Gulf and the weather is 120 degrees out there and they are standing on a couple of inches of steel and it is hot. Those, and someone's jet exhaust is blowing on them. Absolutely. <laughs> t- t- to increase that 120 degrees, right? So they've given these folks camelbacks, right? Try to keep them hydrated. And again, that safety guy, he's walking around looking at people. So it, it's a dangerous environment. No absolutely. Doubt about it. Absolutely. Okay. So. You know, those folks have about 14 hours. So how do we split up this 14-hour day? We split it up into cycles. And what happens is we usually do about five or six cycles. We take a two-hour break, let people get some food, and then we do three, four, maybe five more cycles at night. And what happens is we divide it up into chunks. It can be an hour, it can be an hour and 15, and it can be an hour 30. And what happens at the beginning of event one, which is the first cycle, we launch, say, 15 airplanes. Those 15 airplanes go flying for an hour. Meanwhile, while those airplanes are flying up there, you have a group of folks getting ready to launch for the second cycle. So let's say the first cycle takes off at 8 o'clock. So 15 aircraft go airborne at 8 o'clock. So at, let's say at 9 o'clock now, you're saying another 12 or 14 or whatever aircraft are going to launch again? Correct. So... We'll have 15, let's call it 15 airplanes that take off at 8 o'clock, and they're supposed to recover at 9. Second event could be another 15 airplanes that are taking off. So those 15 airplanes are getting ready so that they, at 9 o'clock, get launched off. And as soon as they get launched off, the 15 that were already airborne come down and land. And that cycle gets repeated over and over and over. So you have cycles all throughout the day of airplanes that go flying. Those go do their mission. Meanwhile, on the deck, there are people getting ready to go flying, maintenance being done, jets being rearmed, jets being refueled. When those launch, the cycle that's airborne comes down and land, and it happens over and over and over throughout the day. So there's almost no break unless we build it in, like you said earlier, for people to get some food and relax. So basically, every time, whether it's an hour or hour and a half, there is a cycle. We launch aircraft and recover aircraft. The difference being at the beginning of the day, obviously, we just launch. And at the end of the day, we just recover. Exactly. And, and the handler is in charge of parking all the airplanes throughout the flight deck in a manner that allows that launching and recovering. And at the end of the day, that just recovering because space is at a premium. And we just can't have airplanes all over the place because it restricts our ability to move. So we need to know from the squadron, this is the handler thinking now, I need to know which airplane you plan on launching at 11 o'clock because I need to make sure it's in the right position and it's not blocked by other aircraft that are parked, in some cases, inches away. And so an aircraft that went up at 8 and came back at 9, and let's say the 9 o'clock cycle comes back at 10.15, well, the one that came down at 9, can it go back out at 10.15? So between cycles, it can be turned so, around? So that's usually how it happens. Okay. Uh, the airplane lands at 9. The pilot or air crew get out of the airplane. Well, it lands on the 9 o'clock cycle, right? Let's make that clear. Because <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the the ni- nine, 9 is, is more like when the launch 20. starts, right? So you end up, the last airplane could be landing at around 9.30, depending on how big those launches are, right? Or the weather or the flight deck moving. Absolutely. If it uh, if the weather's bad and now we're doing uh, approaches, those take a little bit longer than the normal daytime good weather recovery. So whenever that airplane lands in the 9 o'clock recovery or launch, it gets a pilot or the air crew get out and they talk to the maintainers, they talk to the plane captain, let them know what's going on with the airplane. They spring into action. They go get parts. They go get tools and they try to repair it. Meanwhile, at some point, the new air crew for that airplane comes up and they start walking around making sure everything gets buttoned up correctly because they're going to be going flying at 10, 15, or 10, 30. And before the first pilot even leaves, the purple shirts are connected to it. You might have the red shirts replacing any ordinance that they might have expended or changing it for the next event. Absolutely. It could so be a different configuration. It could right. be practice bombs. Absolutely. It's All that is happening. In a short period of time. Absolutely. And okay. everybody needs to know ahead of time. So we put out an air plan. And all the squadrons denote how many flights they're going to be doing on every given cycle, what ordinance 
is going to be on that airplane, what kind of fuel load it needs, all that is planned, orchestrated, and the coordination happens so that everybody can go do their job when the time comes to do their job. And so if an airplane lands and it's broken, hopefully not because of the pilot, because then you really are going to screw things up, but if it's just broken for they whatever break, reason, then you got a little break. problem. Yes. Because if you didn't tell the handler it's broken and now it's in a premium spot, that's a problem for him. Absolutely. It's a problem for your squadron because if that airplane's not ready, I need another one mm. so that you know the two pilots and maybe going on that next cycle have their aircraft to go do their training or forget training if you're supporting real world operations then that aircraft is expected to be out there so we'll have correct me if i'm wrong some squadron aircraft that are loaded as spares in strategic spots on the flight deck so that if 402 goes down they can go jump in 403 so so that's right so squadrons try not to overextend themselves we give them a certain allotment of airplanes up on the flight deck We'll give him, for example, six fighters and three tankers if you're a tanking squadron. Or we'll give you seven fighters if you're not a tanking squadron. And you write a schedule that allows you a little bit of slop. Maybe you're not using all seven of them at a time because maybe midday one of them breaks. So you need to have that seventh airplane so that they can go fill in. So we do have some slop up on the flight deck, but it's not much. Mm -hmm. And if you start being careless with your reporting, with your parking... It starts driving the flight deck into a a jam, and we start losing sorties, which could affect real-world operations, like you said. And because it can affect real-world operations, we, of course, measure things that matter. So when a squadron gets home from deployment, there's always bragging rights on, oh, we had a 99% sortie completion rate, meaning you know, only one time out of 100 did an aircraft not go for some reason that was avoidable. Correct. So we tend to measure those things because those matter. Because when, as we talked about at the beginning, if the ship shows up, well, we're not going to be very deterring or formidable if, in fact, we stumble out of the gate and can't get airplanes Absolutely. airborne. Absolutely. Our product is airplanes off the pointy end that can deliver ordnance accurately. And if we're not putting them up in the air, we're not delivering our product. That's right. All right, so that is cyclic operations, cyclic operations, however you want to pronounce it. Now, what I'd like to do, Pappy, we've been going at it a while, but I'd like to talk a little bit about catapults because I think that's more or less the same day and night. And then the next couple parts of this series, if you will, will be on the day and the night landings, and we'll have landing signal officers in here to... Were you at Elsa? No, I was not okay. No, I wasn't either. Anyway, we'll have them in here to help us because they know it better than we do, frankly. <laughs> um, so anyway... Again, let's say, you know, I'm coming back from that nine o'clock recovery and, you know, that aircraft that I got out of, you're going to use on the 10, 15, I think I said, launch. So when you get in the aircraft, we've already met the brown shirt, all the other colored shirts have done their thing. You go through your startup, which is not that different than it is ashore with some exceptions that we don't necessarily need to get into. But when the time comes and you're ready, then the yellow shirt comes over and takes custody of you and breaks you down, right? So the blue shirts take the chalk and chains, and then they'll taxi you around. And in some cases, you may be up on the bow, but for whatever reason, the handler, who again is calling all the shots, wants to launch you off the waist catapults. How many catapults are on the carrier? We have four catapults, two on the bow and two on the waist. Okay, so if he wants to launch you off, let's say, Cat 4, which is the leftmost waist catapult, then they've got to taxi you down there and pass you off. So if you would, just take us through the launch process from, let's say there's an aircraft in front of you that is going to be the one that shoots exactly at 1015 and the jet blast deflector is up between you and him. And then you're going to be next. So you're already, your seat is armed up, the ejection seat that is, Mm -hmm. Uh, you're all ready to fly and the JBD comes down and now it's your turn. What's this process like and what's some of the equipment that we would see used in this process? So you're sitting behind the JBD, the airplane in front of you launches away, the JBD comes down. So real quick, the JBD, by the way, jet blast deflector, they pipe water through that, right? So it is water cooled. It has a bunch of tubes around the back that circulate salt water to cool down the metal. Because it's right behind the exhaust, which could be at full afterburner. It could be a full afterburner. So these are barn doors that come out of the flight deck to protect you waiting from the airplane in front. Well, it, it, so what it does, it, it helps a little bit with the propulsion, right? It gives you something to push against, but it also 
deflects that air so that you don't have full afterburning or full military power being blown across the flight deck. So it also goes into protecting the people right. on the flight deck and making more usable space. But it certainly doesn't help anything with the noise. I don't know about no, you. I've sat that, behind JBDs uh, plenty, and you just sit there and rattle and shake. It and, is. Like, you, shoot him. There's a lot of turbulent <laughs> air, but it's just not directed at you. All right. So I hijacked your story. So the JBD goes down, and now there's a bunch of steam, more so in some places than others, because these are, for now, still steam-driven catapults. Uh, correct. So all that is coming from the catapult shot that just happened right in front of you. Right. Um, but... JBD comes down, and you look for your yellow shirt, and he starts giving you directions so that he lines up your nose wheel tire right down the catapult track. They have lines painted on the deck that helps them with positioning your main mount tire, so he's giving you hand signals of turning left, turning right. When he wants small corrections, he'll use his head, and he'll give you a head nod left or a head nod right for just a quick deflection of your rudder pedals, which on ground mode operates your nose wheel. And at one point when he has used pretty straight, he'll hand you over to the catapult director. So he, the yellow shirt in this case, is straddling the catapult, right? So they'll stand there, this, not always? Not, I thought I've seen that. So that's the catapult director. Oh, that is the catapult. So, okay. so, yeah, so we, you know, we could... Oh, that's right. This is the guy kind of near the JBD who will get you going forward. Exactly. And then he'll pass you to that guy who is straddling it. Exactly. And, and then he's going to give you those final Exactly. So I, I kind of I blended them both okay. together. No problem. Um, but, yeah, there's there's one guy setting you up and then the guy straddling the catapult, which is your uh, catapult director that will give you the fine tuning, if you mm -hmm. will, and get you to a spot in which you can now drop your launch bar, which is a, a bar that extends from the nose strut and gets attached to the shuttle, which is a piece of metal that is connected to two huge cylinders underneath the flight deck, which will be powered by steam, as you said, and then launch you down the stroke. So he'll get you to a point, and then he'll give you the launch bar down signal. You'll lower the launch bar. Uh, he might or might not give you a little head nod left or right to make sure that it slides into the track. And uh, you'll have folks making sure that it's lit all the way. They have black marks on them to make sure that the catapult, sorry, the launch bar has completely engaged the catapult. If there's any piece of white showing, there might be something wrong. So again, another safety precaution there. And at that point, you are done taxiing. At that point, they are moving you. Actually, no, not that, not yet. You can add power, but you, you're not steering anymore. Correct. Right? You're not steering anymore. Your launch bar's in the track. And you're just adding power, moving forward along the track until you get to the shuttle. Now, this whole time, and we can talk about the catapult equipment in a moment because I think that'll be interesting. But this whole time, there's also people crawling around your airplane. And obviously, they're staying clear of the intakes and the exhausts because it's a big suction in the front and a big blast in the back. But there's troubleshooters, as we've talked about before, mm -hmm. maybe ordnance personnel. There's a bunch of people looking over your airplane because it's about to go flying. Absolutely. So you have, like we talked about earlier, the troubleshooters giving the airplane one last look. You got the ordies making sure that, you know, your ordnance is armed uh, or ready to be armed correctly. The flares are engaged. You actually have folks from the catapult crew that come and walk right next to your nose gear tire and make sure that uh, not only lo your launch bar is in the track, but your holdback, which is the bar that extends aft of the uh, nose strut, is engaged and also going down the track. And they slowly move you up, at which point you'll go and you'll spread your wings. Once you spread your wings, troubleshooters will jump on there, make sure the, the slats are down, the ailerons are down. Ordies will make sure that the aim nines look right, that the covers are removed, and then you'll finally get to a point where your launch bar is on top of the shuttle but not engaged in the shuttle, and uh, they'll usually hand you over to the AOs to get armed. Okay, so the wingtip missiles, if you have them, have been sticking up in the air because our wings were folded, so now that they're finally down where we can access them at flight deck level, again, the Ordies are jumping all over those. And then at this point, so we're not quite with a cocked hammer, uh, using a, a weapon-type analogy, but we're close to it. So at this point, the yellow shirt will do his little hand toss like he does to another yellow shirt, but to a red shirt, who will then tap his chest and say, okay, I've got you, and I need to arm you up. So we as the air crew will put our hands up showing, hey, look, I'm not 
touching anything. Touching anything, no mm-hmm. switch actuations, nothing else. And then they'll arm up anything we may be carrying. If we don't, if we're not carrying anything, they won't. Correct. But if we have missiles, whether it's real or training, or forward firing guns, or in some cases releasable ordnance bombs and whatnot, then they'll arm those up, and then they pass us back to the yellow shirt. So, and in, in one one other point to make there is uh, that we do this same process, whether it's a training round or a live round, so that folks get in the habit pattern of doing it no matter what. So you mentioned that, hey, you know, sometimes arming a blue missile or, you know, a live missile, doesn't matter what color it is, guys do the same procedure over and over. So blue is used to denote inert. Exactly. It doesn't explode. So the point being is, let's not treat a fake weapon as fake because we may inadvertently do that to a real weapon. Let's Mm -hmm. treat every weapon like it's real. And even if it's fake, so what? It's good practice. And it's uh, fake is the dumb word, but you know, it's, it's inert. A training. Right. All right. So we're going back. The red shirt is now tapping his chest and sending you over to the yellow shirt, at which point the yellow shirt takes control of you again. And we get ready to taxi that last couple of inches we uh, get the power-up signal. We come up on the throttle a little bit. You'll feel the, the whole back take a hold of you. You'll feel the uh, launch bar slide into the catapult, at which point he'll step off to the side, make sure everybody's clear, and you come back on your power, and you are set. So now your hammer's cocked. Not yet. Not yet. Not so yet. So you are held by the hold back. Your launch bar is on the uh, shuttle, but the shuttle hasn't been armed. Okay. So at that point, once that happens, he'll step off to the side, he'll look around, and now he'll do a signal below his waist. All the signals above the waist are to the pilot, the signals below the waist are to the flight deck crew. And he'll just extend one arm, which means arm the shuttle. At that point, you'll feel the shuttle move a couple of inches, we'll jerk the airplane around, and at that point, we're under the hammer. All right, so let's take a step back. And to be honest, I never fully understood this myself. So let me see if I can get this right. So we've got on the front of the nose wheel is a launch bar that we can raise and lower from the cockpit. And it sits in a shuttle. And that shuttle is going to pull us eventually here in a few seconds in this story down the catapult. But there's something on the back of the nose wheel that's holding us back. Correct. So how does this work? So in other words, right now in our world here, as we're telling the story, we're in tension, we would call it. Correct. But the tension pulling forward is less than the tension holding us back. So what, what is on the back of our wheel or, or the hold back? How does the hold back work? So the hold back is a, a bar that is attached to basically, I, there's a term for them, but I don't know what it is right now, two basically teeth that come out from the catapult track. And then it has some sort of slip mechanism, which is the fat part of the hold back. Okay. And that is designed to be able to hold some tension back, but not all of the tension generated by an actual catapult activation. And that slips into what's called the holdback mechanism on the strut. And it's a slip coupling, if you will. Okay. So on the front of the wheel, we're pulling. On the back of the wheel, we're holding back. Correct. And we're pulling to a certain point. We haven't applied all of the steam pressure. We're just applying some steam pressure to create that tension. But less than the holdback. But less than the holdback. Okay. And not releasing the full activation of steam as well. So you are in tension, but the catapult hasn't fired. Okay. So at this point, the tension signal occurs, and it was that was below the waist, you said. Correct. So he goes below the waist. He extends one arm, the arm going forward on the ship. The way you're going to go. Exactly. The, the way you're going to launch. He'll extend that arm. You'll feel the thump in your airplane. And at that point, when he feels a thump, there'll be a guy right underneath your nose wheel that will verify that the nose wheel launch bar engaged on the shuttle, that the holdback is still looking good. He'll run out with his thumb up, and at that point, the yellow shirt that puts you into tension will tap his head and give you over to the shooter. So we talked about the shooter before. This is an aviator who's on a tour of something other than flying. Correct. But he knows what's going on. He's an aviator. So he is now, as an officer, commissioned officer, Mm -hmm. the person in charge and it rests on him to make sure that everybody's doing their job so now at this point is the throttle coming up in the cockpit so once the yellow shirt hands you over to the shooter the shooter will give you the throttle up signal and uh, you will go ahead and pull your throttles all the way forward whether it's mill or afterburner you first go to military thrust and then you'll start doing a controls you'll go all the way forward all the way aft all the way left all the way right 
make sure that all four corners of your controls are nice and free. You'll go full left rudder, full right rudder. Once you're satisfied, you'll look back at the shooter. The shooter at that point will give you the afterburner signal if you're going into afterburner. If you're heavy enough to require it. Correct. Yeah. And if you're not going after into afterburner, then you'll go ahead and salute the shooter saying, hey, all my systems are good to go. I am ready to go flying. He'll salute you back. He'll look at all the safety observers on the flight deck. He'll point at them, looking for thumbs up from everybody. And at that point, when he's happy, he'll look forward, make sure there's nothing going on forward of the airplane, touch the flight deck at point going flying, at which point the catapult operator will look forward, will look aft, look at the airplane one last time, and then press the button on the deck edge if we are doing deck edge launches. Right. If we're doing bubble launches, all that happens in the bubble by the shooter. Except that you'll have a topside safety petty officer who's acting in the shooter's capacity, right? But he'll pass it to the guys in the bubble. But he'll pass it to the shooter in the bubble. In the bubble, right. Okay. So while you're wiping out the flight controls, who's looking at you? There's one guy on either side of the aircraft, just mere feet from an airplane putting out 40,000 pounds or maybe more of thrust. Not an enjoyable environment but between the noise and the vibration everything else but it's pretty ooh, enjoyable ooh. it's pretty awesome uh, so those are the troubleshooters we okay. talked about right the right. troubleshooters after they have come all the way from the nose of your airplane going looking at the size looking at the wings well, looking they did at that the, before you went into tension exactly looking right. at all the gear they looking at they end up them parking themselves right next to your stabs so they're watching your flight controls and they're looking for full deflections they're looking for the full deflection forward full deflection aft all the controls they're looking for your rudders if it's at night they look for the lights to come on and all the lights to be on but when they look at it the guy closest to the shooter will be the guy in charge he'll look across the other shooter on the other side he'll give him a thumbs up when he sees a thumbs up he will give another thumbs up now to the shooter saying hey we're all good to go let him fly. And those are the guys that, that I said the shooter's looking at before he touches the deck and points forward. Gotcha. And these are squadron guys, so they'll follow their own airplane to the catapult. Mm -hmm. Once it shoots, they get out of the way for the next mm -hmm. one. But what if they see some hydraulics leaking or they don't see the full deflection of the flight control? So if, if they see any trouble, if anybody sees any trouble, all they have to do is do the cross hand signal. So they'll do a big X in front of them with their forearms and uh, everybody drops to one knee. And at that point, the launch gets suspended. Okay. What if everything looks good on the outside, but there's something I see on the inside that I don't like? So if the pilot wants to suspend the launch, he will start shaking his head left and right, trying to get the attention of the shooter saying no, you know, basically a no sign, right. don't, don't launch me. And he'll simultaneously transmit over the radio to the air boss, suspend with whatever catapult you're sitting on. Okay, so they can put some sort of safety mechanism so in. So at that point, the air boss will hit the suspend button on that catapult, and that will prevent the operation of that catapult. So back to our pistol example, the hammer's cocked, but I can put the safety on and it can be cocked, but it, you pull the trigger, nothing's going to Nothing's going to happen, gonna happen. Okay. absolutely. So we talked about saluting in the daytime. What do we do at night? You touched on it a brief So at night, uh, obviously the shooter's not going to be able to see us, so we, what we do is we turn our lights on whenever we're ready to go flying. So the position lights come on, formation lights, and the strobes, which people have all seen on the regular airlines, the just flashing lights. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So, boom, off we go from zero to 170 miles an hour in some Ish, case. Yes. In a couple hundred feet. 1.7 seconds. And 1.7 seconds. So that's got to be about as good as a drag racer, I would think. It is. We, we end up winning the drag race. They beat us in the first 60 feet or so. Okay. But, uh, but we end up faster at the end. Very cool. Now, what's going on just below decks there that makes this work? Now, again, eventually we're going to have, in fact, doesn't the Gerald R. Ford have electromagnetic catapults? But everything else right now has steam. So just below decks is where this big cylinder is. And what's going on briefly down there? So down there, real quick, you, those two pistons that I mentioned earlier get connected to a valve, which is called a launch valve. And that valve is responsible for opening at a certain rate to a certain aperture in order to allow a predetermined amount of steam to force those pistons all the way down the catapult track. But we have a big accumulator that gets filled up with steam to a launch pressure by the reactors making that steam. And, uh, that's basically the process really quick. It's it's a steam accumulator that gets funneled through a launch valve, which opens, has a controlled rate and aperture of opening 
to control the amount of steam because not every airplane uses the same amount of steam to go flying. You don't need the same force to launch an E-2 than you need to launch a F-18 without any ordnance. Well, even an F-18 could have nothing on it, or a Super Hornet, for example, could be slick or have five drop tanks. And Absolutely. That's a significant difference. Every single, uh, what we call end speed, is determined by your configuration, whether it's where the ordnance is loaded or how much ordnance is loaded. Uh, and all that gets calculated into a what we call end speed, which is the speed that they want you to have at the end of the stroke. And so the green shirts downstairs are managing those valves, but you've also got the shooters who know, okay, this is how hot it is today. This is the density altitude because of that. This is the wind that we have over the deck. So there's tables to know that, okay, this particular aircraft with these environmental conditions and this weight, here's the speed we need to give him to go fly. And there's some safety in there. We're not going to put him right at stall speed. Exactly. And And we know the speed, which then correlates to a pressure Right. and a launch valve aperture and cycle. And speaking of that, we did gloss over, unless they don't use it anymore, it's been a while since my last cat, but the weight board operator, right? So as you're taxiing across the JBD, going back a few seconds in our scenario here, but mm-hmm. several minutes in our discussion, there's a, a petty officer or somebody who's holding up a board that he can change the numbers on, and it tells you what he thinks your gross weight is for that shot. Exactly. And then you either give him a thumbs up, which means everything's good, or you give him the, the hand palm up, which is, hey, go up a thousand pounds, or you give him a hunt down a thousand pounds. If it's way off, instead of going up, 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 right. and over and over and over, you just come up on the radio and say it, and you'll see them run out because <laughs> the air boss just called the shooter and said, hey, you know, 111 needs a 65,000 pound shot. Right, not 45,000. Exactly. Right. And then they'll run out, they'll get told, and then they'll come back, and it'll say 65,000. And at that point, you give them the thumbs up. Excellent. All right. Well, we've talked about normal operations for the catapult. We've talked about day and night, and it's not that much different at night, except it's obviously darker. And, and you're, you're following wands instead yeah. of hands, yeah? And, and frankly, as the air crew are concerned, there's not much to do from that last little bit of nose guidance for the wheel and not touching anything when the orties are there and then doing the wipeout that you talked about. But other than that, you're kind of along for the ride. Absolutely. As long as your trim is set correctly, they're going to plop you in the air in front of the ship and it should rotate to the right attitude to fly away. Yeah, you're just a guest at that point. You're right. just a rider. On episode four of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we had Bloach come on and talk about the time the catapult didn't go well. In his case, something happened and it ripped the nose wheel off an F-14. And unfortunately, the pilot perished. I don't know if you ever knew Basher. Um, I did. What are some mistakes or what kinds of things can, can go badly? And to be clear, they usually don't. I mean, there can be thousands and thousands of uneventful catapults. But there was one example where the catapult had a problem. And in, in, in that case, it wasn't the catapult. It, wasn't it, it was a mechanical failure of what we call the, the nose collar. Oh, it was on the aircraft. It was the piece that the launch bar attaches to on the strut itself that failed. Oh, wow. So the catapult operated just normally in that case. It was a nose collar failure on the ca- on the actual airplane itself. But we, we can have some failures of the catapult system. We can have what's called a cold shot in which the steam doesn't propel the airplane down the track as fast as it could. And you can have a misfire. Misfire is a little bit safer, but more unnerving, if you will, because at that point, the guy supposedly presses the button and has commanded the catapult to fire, but it hasn't fired, right? At which point, everybody raises their hands and you stay in the jet with your power ready to go, ready to go (laughs) flying because it's been commanded to fire, but it hasn't until they can put some safeties in. And when they put those safeties in, the shooter will stand in front of your airplane and give you the throttle back signal. And if any, if he's willing to stand in front of my airplane, then I'm willing to come back on the throttle, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so if anything causes us to suspend, then they'll put the safety mechanism in. And once they know it's safe, he'll step in front of you, and then they'll just give you the throttle back mm-hmm. signal. And then if it can be reset and Good to go. Can they just basically pick back up where they left it off? It can be a mismatch of one or two settings. It can be something mechanical didn't happen. The, the, you know, the deck could have gone off of cycle with the water. There's tons of stuff. Some of it can be fixed. Some of it can't. It just uh, They'll make the determination, and they'll come back. And usually the air boss will come over the radio and tell you why that was a suspend. Unless you're the one who suspended it, in which case he'll be asking. It, exactly. <laughs> they will. Yeah. And, uh, and then they'll set you back up or not. Talk about 
about, though, real quickly, out of cycle with the water? In other words, if the ship is pitching because we're in rough seas, Mm -hmm. what do they try to do? They try to time it on the upswell? So they try to time it on the upswell. So they'll touch the fly deck, and the deck edge operator will go ahead and press the button as the deck is coming up to give you a little bit more uh, margin. They'll try not to shoot you as as the deck is coming down with a two or three degree down angle. Sure. You know, prevent that from happening. But sometimes it can be a unnerving ride as you're going down that catapult Face stroke. Water, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now suppose I wave it off. I shake my head and say, nope, no good. Jet's broken. And I know it's not something I can fix quickly. Let's say they're going to spin me off the catapult. We can probably finish with this now. What, what's the process for that? So if, if something's wrong and you're not going to be flying or they got to move you catapults, at that point, what they'll do is they'll take the shuttle and they'll move it back a couple of inches so that it disengages from your launch bar. They'll tell you to raise the launch bar. The guy that usually walks along your tire, the green shirt from the catapult crew, will come off to the side and show you the whole back fitting. That way you know it's off the aircraft. Then that way you know it's disengaged. Okay. And at that point, they'll probably fold your wings up and then they'll start taxing you. They move you forward a little bit straight so that your tire doesn't hit the shuttle and uh, cause a gash or anything like that. And then they'll move you over to some other catapult. If you were armed... At that point, before they move you all the way out, they'll hand you over to Ordies, and Ordies will come, and all the ordnance that they readied for flight, they'll safe it back up um, before folding the wings or before moving you forward. But other than that, you kind of taxi around, uh, either go to another catapult or go park so that they can work on it. And that's always a bummer, because when you think you're going flying, you never, you never like to get pulled off. Especially if it's a real mission, right? You, yeah. you want to be going out there. That's right. Excellent. Well... Pappy, that has been an outstanding overview of the aircraft carrier and catapult procedures day and night. I want to thank you very much for that. Like I said, we're going to talk day and night landings in the next couple episodes, but assuming those guys cover those parts, is there anything you think we're missing that the listener might be interested in in general here as far as no, just the basic uh, operations one, go? One piece of perspective that I want to offer is uh, – the age of the individuals on the flight deck. It is pretty amazing as a 47-year-old individual that has been doing this for 25 years, when I walk on the flight deck and I look at the bright-eyed 18, 19, 20-year-olds that were in high school months ago and are now responsible for preparing your airplane, maintaining your airplane, taxing you around, arming you up, they are dedicated They don't get paid a lot, and uh, they are responsible for a lot. And it's dangerous. And it's very dangerous. The average age on the carrier is about 21 and a half. Wow. Uh, On the whole carrier, out of all 5,000 people? Out of all 5,000 people. That gives you an impression of how young the majority of the crew is. You know, you got a couple of old fogies like me that bring the average up, but... (laughs) You're an outlier. (laughs) We are, we are. Uh, and they're great Americans, and they do a lot for the country. So, you know, you see them, thank them, appreciate them. Uh, it is pretty amazing what they do. No kidding. I completely agree. You know, that was one nice thing about being aviator was we had a chance to just reap the benefits of that and get away from the ship for an hour, hour and a half a day. But they were right down there doing it. And so I think you said it as well as can be said. All right. Well, I want to thank you for talking aircraft carrier stuff. What's next for you? So um, I'm in the what's called deep draft training track. Okay, so you've done exo job of a carrier. This entire nuclear pipeline path, ultimate objective is to be the commanding officer of an aircraft carrier. First step is being the XO of one. Uh, the next step is commanding what's called a deep draft ship. It's a, a big ship. In my case, I'm going to go out to Blue Ridge, uh, LCC-19 out in uh, Yokosuka, Japan, and be the commanding officer of that ship for about 15 months. Basically, they're giving you the keys to the station wagon before they keep you the keys to the sports car. Okay. So headed out to Japan in September, a couple of schools, leadership, legal, those kind of schools, and end up in SWAS before heading out to Japan. SWAS being? Surface Warfare Officer School. So you're an aviator by background, but you could end up being, hopefully, in charge of this 100,000-ton 1,000 foot long, 5,000 people ship. Absolutely. With flight operations happening. And you could be the man responsible. Uh, that is that is the objective. That is the well, goal. Well, let's hope that is the case. And you've certainly worked hard to get there. You talked about the nuclear pipeline. We didn't really touch on it. But again, they take you out of a cockpit and send you to training on 
protons and electrons and neutrons and turn you into a nuclear physicist almost so that when you are in command, you know what the reactor officer is telling you because that's obviously a big deal. It is a big deal. So you need to understand all that. Yeah, it's going back to school after 20 years. Wasn't well, easy. Yeah, I'm sure. Plus, I've heard that school is hard. <laughs> Thankfully, I never had to deal with it. But Chopper Crozier, who you will be replacing on the Blue Ridge, is a good yeah, friend absolutely. of mine. Tell him hello. And he's been there, too. So hopefully he'll blaze the path for you off the Blue Ridge. Will do. Good. It'll Excellent. be fun. All right, Pappy. Well, we have a tradition here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast that I ask my guests to explain their call signs before they leave. So tell us how you got Pappy, if you would. So... I wish it was a better story, but it's, it's pretty benign. Going through flight school, I was the only one in my entire class that already had kids. So being from Puerto Rico and my wife being my high school sweetheart, our kids spoke Spanish, so they called me Papi. And uh, one of my buddies started calling me Papi, and it just stuck. Instead of spelling it P-A-P-I, which is dad in Spanish, I spelled it P-A-P-P-Y and never looked back. Excellent. Well... That's, I think, as good a call sign as any. could certainly be a lot worse, as you know. Absolutely. But, you know, family is so important. No, it's it's fun that it comes because of them. So right. I appreciate it. Outstanding. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, it was my pleasure. And, man, I just hope we can keep in touch. And I look forward to seeing your name at the top of some aircraft carrier someday, Pappy. Hey, thanks a lot, Yo. Appreciate right, it. Let's get out of here. Bye. All right. Well, that was really cool. Big thanks to Pappy Anduzzi for coming on the show. And, again, best of luck to him in the future. Gosh, we probably could have talked for an hour or more additionally than what we already did on just all the nuances and everything that goes into an aircraft carrier. And you probably would have enjoyed it too, but, you know, we had to kind of limit it to the two parts that we did. Just a couple things. I think we did a pretty decent job of explaining all the different terminology and acronyms and whatnot. He did say towards the end... The uh, two troubleshooters when you're in tension on the catapult would be positioned next to the stabs. What he means by that is the horizontal stabilizers. That's the rear horizontal tail or part of the empennage on an airplane. And in the case of the F-18, it's not a tail with an elevator. The actual whole horizontal flight control surface moves. And so they're called horizontal stabilizers or stabilizers. Also, on the previous part, episode 11... I was saying propellers, and I guess technically on a ship they're called screws, so my regrets on that. And then when we said an aircraft carrier displaces 100,000 tons, of course you probably understand that, but just in case, that's another word for it weighs. You know, for anything to float, particularly a vessel, it has to displace or move out of the way a volume of water that weighs the same amount as the ship in order for it to float. So by saying a ship displaces 100,000 tons, it's about saying that's what it weighs. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. We will continue the series on aircraft carrier operations in the next two parts with day and night landings. So stay tuned for that. should be a lot of fun. Just want to take a moment here to thank some of the patrons who have signed up on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and you can look for a Fighter Pilot Podcast on there. These are the fellows who help make this show possible without me having to bombard you with advertisements that you don't want to hear. So to Miko Vejalayan, Bill Horvath, and Brody Basterfield, thanks so much for your patronage and making this show possible. I just want to remind everybody that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Thanks so much for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. If you have a question for the show, you can reach out on social media, send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MOCK-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website where things are changing all the time. It's fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Like I said a moment ago, you can check out our Patreon page if you'd like to gain access to exclusive materials, behind-the-scenes details, and bonus content. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or review anywhere they are available, such as on iTunes or on Facebook, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, well, that will do it for this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. See ya.